Hello, everybody. Welcome to Wine World TV, the best wine show anywhere. I'm your host, Mark Fusco. Before we get started, make sure you're smashing that like button and subscribing to the channel. Every like and subscription helps build the channel. Even better, spread the word to your friends about the best wine show anywhere. All right, so many, many months ago, I got six Chilean cabs from my good friends at Creative Palette to review. This will be the last of the six reviews about them. If you want to know more about Chilean wine in general, then please check out the first video in this series. Of course, this is a free sample provided to me. Neither Creative Palette nor the winery control how I review the wine or what I say. We are finishing up in the Maipo Valley or the Val del Maipo. I'm super excited to finish this series off with this wine as there's a lot of rock star backgrounds going on here, as you'll see. As I already mentioned, the people behind this winery have some impressive credentials. However, the only way to know this is to not switch to the English version of the website. Stick with the native Spanish version. If you have a translation app or built-in translation on your browser of choice, like I do with Safari on a Mac, then life is much easier. Okay, so who are the people behind it? It started with three people, two from France and one from Chile. A fourth person from France joined later. It started in 1984 when Frenchmen Bruno Prats and Paul Pontillier were looking for vineyard land in Chile. They had a mutual friend named Felipe de Solminiac, Solminiac, I think I said that right, who is from Chile, though he has a French background. In 1990, they bought 18 hectares of land in the Peñalolan section of the Chilean capital of Santiago. It's located in the Quebrada de Macul, or the historic heart of the Maipo Valley, Maipo Valley, not Maipo, Maipo. They planted their first Cabernet Sauvignon vines around that time, and the actual winery was complete in 1993. 2002, the fourth partner joined him, uh, Ghislaine de Montgolfier. Looks like Montgolfer, right? But Montgolfier. He makes reference as being the fourth musketeer. All four men are listed as agronomists or winemakers, but let's find out some more about them. I'm just going to copy the info from the website out of convenience. Bruno Patz is the president of the company, has a long list of impressive credentials. Hi, he's French. He's an agronomist enologist, graduate of the Institut National Agronomique in Paris, graduated in viticulture from La École Nationale Supérieure Agronomique de Montpellier, France, owner and winemaker of Chateau Côte de Surnel from 1968 to 1998 uh, in France. He's the president of the classified gross of the Madoc, or was from 1978 to 1998. He's a partner and winemaker of Crisea in the Douro DOC in Portugal. He's a partner and winemaker of Anwilka in Stellenbosch, South Africa. He's a partner and winemaker of Klein Constantia in Cape Town, South Africa. And he's a partner and winemaker of Alphenol in Alicante, Spain. He's also a partner of Vina Aquitania SA in Chile since 1990. I don't know about you, but being the former owner of a super second Co de Chanel, and then not just being a winemaker and partner at Crisea, but the Pratt side of Pratt's and Symington. Oh, and then partner and winemaker at Klein Castancia. Any one of those three would garner him rock star status. And in the other stuff I had to look up, yeah, dude's a legend. Now, and Wilka, that was a partnership with Hubert de Bouard de la Forest. Don't know him? Understandable. He's the owner of Chateau Angelus only one of the best Bordeaux wines out there. They had another partner, Lowell Just, whose family owned Klein Constantia from 1980 to 2011. Now in 2012, they sold Anwilka to Klein Constantia and De Bouard and Pratt's became shareholders. As far as Alphenol, I can't find any recent references or even a website for it. It was a project started in 2009, but I don't think it lasted very long. Paul Pontillier is next. Unfortunately, he passed away in 2016. You'll see QEPD next to his name, which is Spanish for K en Paz uh, Descanse, or Rest in Peace. He's French, or was French, an agronomist enologist, graduate of the Institut National Agronomique in Paris, France, uh, a doctor of enology from the Institut de Enologie de Bordeaux, France, professor of enology in Santiago de Chile starting in 1982. Uh, was the winemaker and general manager of Chateau Margaux since 1983 in France, partner of Vigna Aquitania SA in Chile since 1990. Now, in case you didn't know, that's actually the parent company of this wine here. All right. He unfortunately died on March 27th, 2016. 
Besides his university credentials, being the general manager and winemaker at Chateau Margaux is also something of a rock star status too. Their website has a tribute to him on, his, on the team's page, so see the link below. Moving on, we have general manager Felipe de Solmanac. Uh, he's Chilean, agricultural engineer winemaker from the Pontifical Catholic University of Chile. Graduated in Enology and Vineyard Sciences from the Institute, Institute de Enology de Bordeaux, France. I think I pronounced it wrong the last time. Winemaker advisor of several Chilean vineyards. Partner and general manager of Vigna Aquitania since 1990. Professor of Viticulture at the Faculty of Agronomy and Forestry Engineering of the PUC. While he's mainly on the academic side, he's highly respected. And finally, the director, Guillain de Montgolfier. Now he's French, agricultural engineer, graduate of the Institut National Agronomique in Paris, France, has a diploma in viticulture from the ENSA de Montpellier, president of Champagne Bollinger, or Bollinger from 1993 to 2008, member of the International Council of Development Bank from 1985 to 1995, president of the Union of Maisons de Champagne, Masons of Champagne, right? From 2007 to 2013, president of the Union of Houses and Marks de Vaughan de France which, from 2010 to 2014, and partner of Vigna Aquitania SA in Chile since 2002. Champagne Bollinger alone is enough, but he's got other impressive credentials. Normally, I wouldn't go really deep, or at least in this manner, but considering who's behind the wine, I felt it needed to be highlighted, especially since this wine is not $100 more. The main vineyard that I mentioned in Peñalolín is planted to Cabernet Sauvignon and a bit of Syrah, all of which are ungrafted, very common in Chile as it's phylloxera-free, one of a very small number of countries not affected by phylloxera. It has that combination of alluvial and colluvial soils. It's essentially sandy soils, which phylloxera does poorly in. A large diurnal shift from day to night with temperatures as high as 33 degrees Celsius or 91 degrees Fahrenheit, what I wouldn't give for the height of only been 91 today, especially as the sun's about to beat down hard on me from the window in front of me, uh, to as low as 13 degrees Celsius to 15 degrees Celsius or 55 to 60 degrees Fahrenheit. This is mostly due to the cold winds coming off of the summit of Cerro San Ramon. They practice organic farming and have been working towards certification since 2019. So they should be getting that certification within the next year or two at the most. They also use what is known as technical irrigation, or at least that's how technificata was translated. I'll interpret that as something like controlled or drip irrigation. Besides the vineyard, where the winery is in Santiago, they also have another vineyard in the Tregin Dio of the Mayeco Valley. This vineyard is in the far southern part of Chile, the Bio Bio region, 650 kilometers or about 400 miles south of Santiago. They have Chardonnay, Sauvignon Blanc, and Pinot Noir planted there. This wine, Lazuli, is in reference to the Chilean stone Lapis Lazuli. The partners wanted their flagship or icon wine to be the jewel of the winery. Something I found interesting from their webpage, so I'll mostly quote from their webpage with some adjustments due to the automatic translation not making 100%. All right, the vineyard, because the vineyard, because it is located at the foot of the mountain range of the Andes, receives the cold breeze that comes down from the mountain range, providing the grapes with vegetal and distinctive aromas of the mountain range that translates into fresh menthol smells, sometimes combined with camphor and lots of spice, which gives great complexity and a very different I guess, typicity from other wines of the Maipo Valley. Studies by ours and those from other countries have shown that this set of different aromas is dominated by a molecule called vitisparane, which develops especially in Cabernet Sauvignon in cold areas and in wine, it manifests itself intensely after the second year. Vitisparane is a new one for me. I was expecting to see pyrazine mentioned as it's something that is retained in the Cab family when you have a cooler climate. And while the Alto Maipo, where this wine and all the Maipo wines of this series comes from, isn't necessarily a cool climate, the mountain wind cools things down. Other factors affect how much pyrazine is left over in wine, but that's the most basic reason. Vitisparane is more elusive for me. It's not even mentioned in the actual UC Davis wine chemistry textbook I have, though other related comp compounds are. So I'm interested in looking for it in this wine and I hopefully found it in the other Maipo wines. As you can probably tell, I didn't see this until I wrote this script, which was the last of the series. I did find a website on winemaking that mentions vitisparane, 
link below for that. All right, so comment about the other wines. Um, now that I think about it, I might have gotten some menthol type of thing, but I didn't mention it. So uh, we'll see if uh, we'll see if it's in this one. All right, so I think I've talked up this wine enough. Let's check out the stats for the wine. So the 2017 Vigna Aquitania Lazuli Cabernet Sauvignon suggested retail price forty dollars. Valle del Maipo, though, is technically in the Santiago Dio, which is an Andes climatic Dio. 100% Cabernet Sauvignon. Average vine age is 25 to 30 years. Hand harvested, its elevation is 700 meters or 2,300 feet. They use stainless steel fermentation. It is aged in French oak for 16 months, 30%, which is new. Finding, they use light gelatin. It's unfiltered. Bottled June 2019. The ABV is 2. Point, I'm sorry. <laughs> The ABV is 14.5% alcohol. The RS is 2.92 grams per liter. The pH is 3.5. The TA is 3.67 grams per liter. Production is, well, this is from the 2018 vintage. So the prior, so the next vintage was 11,332 bottles. All right, let's get into the wine. So I totally forgot about the menthol thing. I wish I'd remember that so I could have like, looked for it in the other wines. I kind of remember having something like that, but I didn't mention it. I didn't mention mint or anything like that. I was just talked about green and it was more like it was herbaceous rather than um, menthol or can I, I don't know what camphor really smells like. All right. So it actually has, um, the color has a little more orange to it. I mean, it is a 17 versus the others. The others were 18, though one was a 16. The 16, the, the color was really red. Uh, this one seems to have a little bit of oranging going on, so it might be a little oxidation happening here. Uh, but it's still it's still red. But it's a kind of a moderate minus concentration. Not quite Pinot-like, but it's very light. For a cab, especially. Um, a cup medium minus staying on the glass. And then as far as tearing well it, it, it kind of went down pretty quick i mean i would i would probably call that moderate but i know this is a this is high moderate plus the high but i've been using the same glass for like all these other wines so it may be coated really well with alcohol so it's just streaming down really easily all right so on the nose uh, moderate aromatics i feel like it is a bit developing i mean technically it's a four-year-old wine since it's southern hemisphere and it's july that i'm doing this but I get more red fruit, almost a bit of a cherry thing going on. Do I get the menthol? I guess kind of. I mean, I think that's where all that out when I said I smell alcohol. I think that was the menthol coming through on all those other wines. Raspberry, strawberry. Yeah, when I kept talking about like, you know, the it was like like a Luxardo, um, a syrupy type of stuff, and then mixed with alcohol. I think that was that, I think that was that menthol thing going on. No overt smell of oak, but if I had to guess, maybe a little cinnamon. Let's taste it. There is that mintiness to it. And you know what? It's kind of funny because also eucalyptus, right? Not in this wine necessarily. I mean, that's usually from South, uh, from, from, uh, South Australia, really, from Australia. But it makes sense more about that, that molecule that vitisparin, that it's in Cabernet Sauvignon, but it had to be in a cooler climate situation. So it makes sense that you get that, you get that minty, but menthol thing, I guess. So that's going to be something I'm going to have to pay attention to more in the future. It kind of is kind of like Vicks Va Vapor Rub. It kind of is like that. I kind of get that, that thing going on. And I've, I've heard people use that as a, as a descriptor for wine. So now I get it. Okay, um, but with that said, it's still got all the red fruits. I mean, they're, they're slightly tart in nature. Uh, they're not super ripe, uh, but it's raspberry, strawberry, blackberry. Um, you've, got the, you've got that mint thing going on. You've got some green, not quite really pyrazinic bell pepper. Green pepper was like that more of a green tobacco, fern type of thing, leafy type of stuff, green. Um, a little bit of cinnamon, clove. Not much vanilla, but baking spice type of thing. Um, you can, you do feel the alcohol. 
Um, it's super tasty. It's kind of light. Like the tannin is not as aggressive as cabs usually are. Like the whole lineup of, of these Chilean wines, for the most part, were not high tannins or even medium plus. They had like what one that I, I was like, oh, the tannin like showed up. The rest of them have been really well integrated. Very impressed with all the wines in this series, honestly. It's the last one of, of this of, of my session, so I'm gonna drink the rest of this. Um, there's an elegance to the wine, there's a refinement to the wine. Um, is it worth $40? Because everything else was like 25 bucks and under, and everything was totally like, uh, yeah, you could crush it for that. I think I think the Los Vascos, I said, you could, I could pay up to 30 or 40. I think this is, reminds me of the Los Vascos in quality level. Um, is this a $40 bottle of wine? Yeah, I think it is. I think you could charge 50 for it, maybe 60 and get away with it. Um, I mean, the thing is, when we think about Chilean wine, we don't usually think about wines that are really in this 40, 50, 60 dollar range retail. We have like our 20 dollars and under, and then you have like the iconic wines that are approaching a hundred dollars. Now you do have wines in between, but they don't seem to get as much um, um, notoriety, I guess. People who know know, right? But you see like the Don Melchors and the and the Purple Angels, which is like 80 bucks, you know, and then you get to and then you get to things like, you know, Alma Viva, uh, which is another hundred some odd dollar bottle of wine, uh, Cloa Palta, you know, $200. You know, you got your like rock star, like high, high end wines. And then you get like your, your lower end stuff that's usually closer to $10. So like this whole series of wines is like that 20 ish to $40 bottle of wine are kind of wines that maybe you don't necessarily think about or don't go, yeah, you know, it's Chilean wine. It probably won't be worth that. But every single wine in this series is definitely worth the price of admission. Uh, and a few of them, I'm like, yeah, you, you. If it was more expensive, it, I could see it being worth that. I like this wine a lot. The Creative Palette, thank you so much. All the wineries who who have participated in this Chilean wine thing, thank you so much. I do apologize that it took so so long, forever, for this to actually get put out. Um, I kind of explained that in the in the update episode, but yeah, awesome. If you can find this wine, this I think this is one of those wines I think is really hard to find in the states. Only certain states have it. If you can find it, you should get it. Sorry, could you say that again? Sorry, I couldn't hear what you said. Hi Siri. <laughs> I said almost on cue. I said if you can find this wine, you should get it. That's actually kind of funny. I'll make sure to leave that in there. Um, anyway, um, yeah, it's time for me to have some dinner and watch some TV, and I'm probably gonna eat some pizza. And I've got all kinds of cool wine to try with that. Anyway, that's going to do it for today's show. If you enjoy what I'm doing here, make sure to hit that like button and subscribe. And tell all your friends. I'll see you next time. Hoping I'm not sweating so much. <laughs>